If you're just joining us, we're going to get started in just a minute. We're just allowing everyone into the Zoom room. Well, hello everyone. I'm Rick Hassan of UCLA School of Law and the Safeguarding Democracy Project. And I'd like to welcome you today to the final installment of the spring 2023 webinar series for the Safeguarding Democracy Project. I'd like to thank Harley Hamm and Ben Austin DeCampo for their important logistical support today. We've had some great uh, webinar programs uh, this semester and last. Uh, the series will pick up again uh, in, in August or September when the school year starts here back at UCLA Law. All of the earlier webinars uh, are linked at the Safeguarding Democracy Project website, which you can get to by typing uh, into your browser, safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. We also held a major symposium a couple of weeks ago uh, called uh, Can American Democracy Survive the 2024 Elections? Uh, the videos uh, of that event are not yet available, but they will be posted shortly uh, at that website. Today, I'm pleased to welcome two guests to speak uh, about the so-called insider threat to elections and means of protecting election officials. These are both topics that were not even on my radar screen a few years ago, but they today are among the most urgent topics uh, and most important issues uh, that I'm thinking about uh, here with our work uh, at the Safeguarding Democracy Project. We've got two great guests to talk through these issues today. Uh, first is uh, Liz Howard. Liz serves as Senior Counsel for the Brennan Center's Democracy Program. Her work focuses on election security. She regularly comments for television, radio, and print media on issues related to election security and election administration. She's testified before the U.S. House Committee on Homeland Security and a variety of state legislatures. She's been uh, co-author on multiple Brennan Center reports, including one called Better Safe Than Sorry, Defending Elections, Trump-Russia Investigations, A Guide for Preparing Cyber Attacks and Technical Failures, and a, guide, uh, and a Guide for Election Officials. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, Howard served as Deputy Commissioner for the Virginia Department of Elections. We're also joined by Dr. Judd Schott. Uh, Judd is Colorado State's election director, a position he's held since 2009. He's served as president of the National Association of State Election Directors and was founding member of the Government Coordinating Council formed by the Department of Homeland Security following Russian interference in the 2016 election. He's on the board of the University of Minnesota Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs Certificate and Election Administration Program and teaches courses on election law and security. He's a member of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Election Reform Task Force and serves on the Election Administration Research and Practice Editorial Board. Um, uh, I'll begin today um, with some questions, and I know Judd has a short uh, presentation of some slides, but I want to tell you now that you can submit your questions for the panel using the Q&A function on Zoom, and I'll try and get to those. Uh, at the later part of the program. So welcome to you both, uh, Judd and Liz. And uh, Liz, I'd like to uh, open by starting with you, just asking the basic question, what do we mean by the insider threat uh, 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 in elections? And uh, you know, what kind of threats are election officials facing from the outside? So kind of the inside and the outside threats. Uh, thank you so much, Rick, and thank you so much to um, the UCLA Law Safeguarding Democracy Project for hosting this webinar today. Um, these issues, threats against our election officials and insider threats, are related. So talking about threats against election officials, um, you know, first, I think it's important to mention, as you did earlier, that this is a new, threats against our election officials are a, a, a new phenomenon. Um, I served as an election official as recently as 2018, and um, I 
uh, don't ever recall uh, being threatened, um, nor do I ever recall anyone threatening my family members for decisions that I made while I served as an election official. Um, but that picture is very different today. The Brennan Center conducted a survey of local election officials last year. Um, one in six election officials reported being threatened. Um, and these threats aren't coming in, you know, anonymously online. Uh, almost three in four of the election officials who had been threatened indicated that these threats were coming in over the phone, um, you know, and or in, a, you know, a smaller percentage reported that these threats were coming in in person. Um, and again, uh, you know, at least one election official has had to obtain a restraining order because of issues with people um, in her office to protect her and her staff. Um, I think it's also important to mention that uh, these threats against our election officials are are um, nonpartisan and they're an ongoing issue. Um, just after the 2022 election, we saw a Republican um, election official who had to be moved to an undisclosed location because of threats against him. Um, and we also saw an election denier in New Mexico, um, you know, organize or you know be responsible for allegedly um, uh, shots fired at the homes of local officials. Um, this is a serious problem. And that means that it's not surprising um, that the, in our survey, we found about one in five election officials who indicated that they are unlikely to continue serving as an election official going forward. And we can see this across the country. Um, some people have described what we're seeing right now as an exodus of election officials. Um, and to tie this back to insider threats, right? Threats that somebody that has access to our election system will um, conduct an impermissible act and interfere with our elections. Um, we, in our survey, we also found um, that more than half of the election officials were concerned that those who were taking the place of the election officials that are leaving would believe in the false allegations about widespread election fraud. So, you know, they're concerned about situations like what we saw in Colorado with Tina Peters, where there's a county clerk, basically the chief local election official, um, who um, allegedly uh, uh, started to believe um, after she was first elected in 2018 and after what appeared to be a very boring 2020 election in Mesa County, um, that there was widespread fraud. And, you know, it has been alleged that she has violated um, state law um, and provided impermissible access to voting systems, um, you know, very, um, uh, feel very lucky to be here today with Judd to talk about the swift action that Colorado um, state and local officials have taken in response to this insider threat. But I think in good news that there are, you know, common sense measures that we can take to address and mitigate not only um, insider threat concerns, um, which are typical in the cybersecurity protocols that one sees um, across the board, right? Not just in elections, but all over the place. Um, and there are also things that we can do to help protect our election officials. Um, we can talk about some of the things that, uh, you know, while we think it's important, for instance, that the DOJ has set up an elections thrust threat task force, right? We think that there are steps that they can take to improve um, what they're doing and improve protections, but happy to talk about potential solutions um, later. Almost forgot to unmute, which is of course what happens on every, uh, on every Zoom. Um, thank you for that great introduction that kind of sets the stage. Uh, so we can turn to Judd, Judd who's someone who's on the front lines as the director of elections in Colorado. So Judd, let me just ask you, um, how's Colorado dealing with these both insider and outsider threats? Uh, well, first, thank you for uh, inviting uh, Liz and I today to talk to you. Um, we appreciate UCLA's uh, Safeguarding uh, Democracy Project. And um, really, I think this is such an important topic. And so I'm um, excited to be a part of it. Um, well. Uh, so I guess the 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 real answer is that um, there's no way to to perfectly guard against insider threats, and there's no way to perfectly protect yourself from external threats. Uh, but being aware of the problem and then um, uh, taking necessary uh, measures to try to protect yourself and those who uh, work in your field are, is important. Um, that's happening both at uh, the state level, but it's also happening nationally. Um, for instance, uh, the uh, state of Colorado um, 
does basic things like uh, we we uh, uh, have hired a nonprofit uh, and a vendor, a different uh, two different uh, vendors to uh, look out for harassment and threats related to our office, uh, the people that work in our office, my Secretary of State, and then uh, also county elections officials. Um, there are also uh, efforts afoot on the national uh, stage to try to uh, incorporate that into some of the functions of national associations. So the National Association of State Election Directors is undertaking a project um, like that, especially for states where they don't have the infrastructure or perhaps the interest in uh, doing that level of review for their state election officials. Um, but then on the insider threat issue, the we have been uh, in Colorado on the once bitten, uh, twice shy um, side of this, where uh, once it's happened to you, you uh, understand the necessity to uh, try to institutionalize certain measures to make it more difficult or to punish those who do uh, uh, sort of take part in these kinds of insider threat um, issues related to elections. And so that's what we've tried to do both uh, through policies, which we can, we have some say about at the state level, but then also through legislation. So we passed legislation in uh, 2022 to address the insider threat, which I think is, uh, could be seen as a model for uh, legislation in other states where they would be able to employ some of these same strategies. And were you you were going to share some slides with us? Yeah, and through. I can do that if you like. Uh, yes, yeah, so why don't you so, do that, and then we can uh, <coughs> kind of dissect uh, that. And I'm going to come back to Liz and ask her about other approaches uh, to this uh, as well. So you should see my screen there, the full screen. Hopefully, we see it. Uh, excellent. Uh, all right. So let me. I'll, I'll walk you through. Don't don't worry. I'm not going to bog you down with a lot of PowerPoint. I just wanted to uh, walk you through some some of the basic things that we've done. So there's I'm going to talk to you about two bills. One is uh, 22 SB 153. Just to let you know what that lingo means, it's the year 2022. It's a Senate bill, and the Senate bill number was 153. So you'll see that we have a House bill here in a minute. This bill was about insider threats and then just general election improvements. Um, and those election improvements have a lot to do with the insider threat issue. So some of the insider threat um, components of this bill was to create a crime for the tampering, uh, tampering with uh, voting systems. Uh, that is under this new Colorado law felony, which could um, get you as much as two years in prison and a $500,000 fine. It's also under, under SB 153, a crime to image a voting system. This is a common strategy employed by um, people who believe in election uh, fraud, um, who, uh, and, and they, they wanna go and capture an image of the voting system because they think that they'll be able to track down how the voting system is fraudulently counting the votes. Um, that is not accurate. And then it's on top of that, um, uh, an overreach for the definition of election record and frankly, an incredible burden on a county or a local election official. So we defined what an election record is to not include this kind of extraneous information, um, like an image or uh, every keystroke of the various computers that, the, uh, that define the system. For uh, elected officials in somewhat larger counties, so counties of 100,000 or plus, plus in Colorado, which for us would be 11 counties, um, they have no access to the voting systems, either through key card access to a voting system room, or they can't be alone with a voting system. Um, and then we institutionalized uh, a 24-7, uh, 365 video surveillance of all of our voting systems, including keyless entry to each one of the uh, parts of our, um, or to a room where that uh, system might be. And that gives us both a continuous surveillance so that we can go back and look and see if there are any issues related to specific, uh, specific time periods. But then we can also go and see who entered that room at a given time and track entry based on that keyless entry as well. So we can find out if 
a county clerk who's not supposed to be in that room was there at 1 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. And we can go back to the video and, and pull that video up and see what happened. Uh, the law also provided a million dollars in grants for the counties to implement these various systems. Uh, we've gone through two rounds and we've pretty much fully used that million dollars now. And this is enforced as of July 1 of 2023. So we anticipate all of our counties will have this fully implemented um, by this summer. Uh, let me also tell you about some election improvements that were included in that bill that also sort of relate to this question of insider threat. We uh, disqualify certain people from serving as designated election officials. That's what a DEO is. Um, the conviction of, a, of an elections offense. So we have uh, offenses in the elections code. Um, and that would be for both Colorado, but then for any other US jurisdiction. And then also conviction for conspiracy to commit sedition, insurrection, or treason. That might be uh, of special relevance now where those words would have made no sense a couple of years ago. Uh, now we are concerned about people that had some relationship to July uh, to January 6th um, coming up and, and running for one of our offices and becoming an elections official. Uh, we also require certification training for all of our county clerks and elections officials. That's a very involved training, uh, several classes. We have uh, 14 required classes plus um, all these uh, voluntary classes as well. And each one is two to four hours. So it's a quite a um, significant um, training overhaul that we had to employ to, uh, um, to make sure that everyone was certified to be operating in our election systems. We made it a misdemeanor to disobey an SOS order. So the Secretary of State's office, when we order a county to do something or not to do something to disobey it now would be a misdemeanor. We have whistleblower uh, protections for people who uh, report a violation to law enforcement. So if we had a rogue county clerk and somebody on that staff was uh, reported that to us, uh, they would have whistleblower protections. And then when a county fails to canvas, so this is now a new strategy that's being employed by people who um, want to upend our elections. When a county fails to canvas, we can either certify an incomplete canvas ourselves because we have sufficient information about that election to feel comfortable to, can, uh, to canvas it, certify it, um, or we can designate a special master to go in and uh, do that certification for us. And then uh, finally, I, I think something that many elections jurisdictions around the country would really like to have in their law, and that is that ballots must be tabulated on a certified voting uh, system. So this is a requirement of our state law for all counties that have over a thousand um, active registered voters. And for us, that's 61 out of 64. But we do have three counties that could qualify to do a hand count if they so wished. Um, and one of those counties does typically do a hand count. It doesn't, by the way, foreclose the idea of a hand count. It's just that the hand count is not the certified outcome. You can always do a hand count. It's your ballots. If you're a county clerk and you want to do a hand count after the election, Go for it, but uh, you can't do it um, during to, to certify the outcome of the election. We also uh, passed the bill 22 HB 1273, which was the companion to the insider threat bill, which was protecting the elections officials. So we sort of saw these as hand in hand. One is protecting elections from the insiders, and the other one is protecting the insiders from the outsiders protecting the insiders from people who might threaten elections officials. And this included a misdemeanor for doxing elections officials if they were in temp attempting to intimidate or harass uh, those officials. Um, doxing, for those that may not know, is uh, posting a person's uh, personal uh, information online. Um, that can even be personal information which is readily available publicly. So, where you live, what your phone number is, perhaps what your email is, um, but posting it in a way that's designed to intimidate or harass someone would be a violation of that law. Uh, elections officials are also eligible, eligible to become confidential voters. They previously weren't eligible to do that. 
Um, and in fact, it's actually much more elaborate than that. You can go to any uh, state office and demand that their information about you not be publicly uh, available to uh, subscribers or people who want to download that information. And then finally, uh, we made it a misdemeanor to interfere with an election official either while performing their official duties or in retaliation for performing their official duties. So these were all a part of that second bill, sort of protecting the elections officials. But we did see it as sort of a, uh, a two-part strategy to, um, uh, let me stop my share, uh, to uh, protect elections from the people and then protect uh, our insiders from uh, the larger population of people who uh, find them to be a threat to their view of um, election outcomes. Thank you. That was very helpful. And, um, uh, you know, one of the things that's uh, pretty uh, obvious here is that dealing with insider threats and outsider threats are very different kinds of issues. So let, let's separate the discussion a little bit. Let's focus first on threats to election officials. And Liz, let me come back to you. Uh, we've just heard about Colorado's approach. Um, what are other states doing? Um, you know, how does it compare? Are most states doing something? So there is a smattering of states across uh, the country that are that are working on this issue. A couple of states that we've seen already take proactive steps. Some are in line with or partially in line with what you saw in Colorado. Um, so we think certainly one important step that states can take across the country is to protect the privacy of our election officials. So um, in California, they uh, recently passed a law which expanded their safe at home program, which would allow election officials to enter into um, a state run program that uh, protects their private information, including their home address from disclosure on government databases. Um, of course, this is imperfect, but, you know, making it more difficult for people that are interested in doing harm to them um, is, is an important step forward. And, you know, we think that it helps the election official helps keep them safe and helps make them feel safe, which is also um, important. Uh, in Maine, um, uh, just last year, we saw them make threatening an election official a crime. Um, the bill also included a couple other provisions which um, are important, including requiring the Secretary of State to conduct de-escalation training um, and also uh, required the secretary to build a program that would allow election officials to report these threats to the secretary. I think that one of the biggest challenges um, in the protecting election official space is the um, lack of data. It is really incredibly hard um, to understand the breadth of this problem. Um, one of the other things that our uh, survey of local election officials found last year was that more than half of election officials who receive these threats don't report them. Um, and then when they do report them, about 90% of them report them to local law enforcement. Um, so there's not a collection mechanism for, for these threats. So, so those are important. We're also seeing um, bills uh, that are currently um, uh, being debated in a couple of other states around the country, and including Michigan, um, where uh, there's two bills, one which would prohibit carrying weapons within 100 feet of not only polling locations, um, but also early voting centers, also absentee ballot drop boxes and um, absentee ballot counting boards. Um, and then in Minnesota, we've seen a bill that would prohibit the coercion, um, whether by force or intimidation of an election official while conducting their um, duties as an election official. So, uh, Judd, uh, sticking with the uh, threats to election officials, uh, um, what do you think the role of the federal government should be here? Is it is it a matter of money? Uh, do states and local governments want federal legislation? N not that that would happen necessarily, but is, is that a desirable thing to have some national legislature, maybe even to deal with data collection on the threats that Liz just referred to? Yeah, so good question. Uh, the uh, as Liz mentioned um, in the uh, after your first question, the uh, Department of Justice did create a task force, uh, which is actively working. Uh, we 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 know um, we uh, send our threats and uh, severe harassment to uh, the task force uh, almost on a daily basis, sometimes weekly. 
Um, and uh, if if we don't, if we go a good week or two without getting very much, we'll we'll send it every other week. Uh, but we um, it's in the course of a month, we will send multiple uh, emails or notices to that task force to alert them to various um, th threatening interactions we've seen uh, typically in social media. Um, that that uh, has not really tapered off. It's sort of changed. In uh, 2020 and 2021, we were largely getting direct threats. Um, like I, I uh, personally received 40 or 50 or 60 uh, direct threats through email or phone calls or uh, messages left on my cell phone and various things. I mean, it just was um, pretty common. I mean, it was really almost got to the point where it was daily or you know multiple times a week. Uh, and now they've uh, largely gone into um, uh, sort of the corners of social media, uh, and they're sort of talking amongst themselves. Right? Uh, doesn't make it any less threatening. Uh, but it is um, it is sort of focused internally, uh, and because of the nature of the conversation and who the conversation is with, the task force uh, struggles to find a nexus to create a criminal liability. Um, and I think that that is our our biggest concern at the state level is we can see the discontent, we can see the harassment. Um, it's in ev everything, like Jenna Griswold, my boss, uh, Secretary of State in Colorado. She, if she, you could just go to her Twitter feed right now and pull up the last thing she put on Twitter, uh -huh. and you will see that half of the responses that she has to her Twitter, whatever that was, um, are harassing or threatening. Uh, it's just a daily fact of life in her social media. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the laws as they're currently written don't really give the task force a lot of flexibility to bring charges on those particular cases uh, because they are not direct, they are not um, timely, they are not specific. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be great if the Department of Justice found a way to, um, to be more aggressive, uh, but at the same time, we do understand that they're somewhat limited. I would say that um, one thing they can do, which uh, uh, the attorney general uh, uh, even mentioned during uh, his conversation to elections officials last year, was that um, in his experience, uh, when people had um, uh, threatened him, uh, FBI agents would go knock on their door and say, hey, what did you mean by this threat? And of course, that may not end up in any kind of criminal liability, but it uh, certainly is a shot across the bow uh, at somebody who is has previously done something that may do something in the future. So um, so that's a that's quite a uh, an option that's available. And the um, uh, I think the FBI and the Department of Justice have shied away from that, even though uh, I think it's a great first step. Uh, so I wish that they would be more proactive in that respect. But I do appreciate the fact that the task force exists. We have relationships. We have been able to provide information to them. They can track our information over time. Um, I know we are a frequent flyer for them, uh, and they have you know a lot of information about Colorado, uh, maybe even more than they really want. Uh, but uh, for that reason, that you know um, uh, we've developed some relationships with them. So I think there's good for, from it, but I, I wish that there was more. Thanks for that. And uh, Liz, uh, you were at our conference a couple of weeks ago, uh, Can American Democracy Survive the 2024 Elections? And we heard a recording of threats from uh, that Stephen Richer, who's the Maricopa County um, uh, election official, played. And Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State of Michigan, talked about threats against her. Of course, this is going to lead to some attrition. I mean, and I, you know, just hearing Judd, uh, oh, no, it's a daily death threat. You know, it's like, it's insane that this is what we're going through. Um, but you mentioned earlier, Liz, about attrition. And I'm wondering, right, we hear anecdotal reports about attrition. What what's what does the data tell us to the extent that we know about whether and and before you answer, I should say uh, embedded in what you said earlier was that it's a double whammy, right? One, you lose the 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 um 
institutional memory and the experience, uh, but also you might be replacing the person with someone who does not have uh, the same commitment to free and fair elections. So, so what do we know about losses here? Um, yes, all, all of that. Um, you know, uh, big picture, um, we have about eight to 10,000 local election officials in the country. The typical local election official um, who is receiving these threats, um, and, you know, Judd talks about them rather, rather casually because, you know, unfortunately they have been the norm for him, but that that alone is a significant concern that it is, um, you know, just Judd's getting them multiple times a week. But um, our uh, elections, right, like are, are primarily administered at the local level. Um, and these threats are going to state election officials who oftentimes um, have uh, more resources than our local election officials. Um, there, in addition to there not being great data about the threats against election officials, um, there is not great data about election official attrition. Um, you know, we have anecdotal information. I think there's, um, you know, almost a quarter of Utah election officials um, have turned over since the 2020 election. Um, 47 out of uh, North Carolina's 100 counties have new election directors since in the past three years. Um, and again, because we don't have um, a really good database that tracks all of these things and elections are administered so differently across the country, you know, so we have um, in, Mis in Michigan and Wisconsin, for instance, there are um, about 1,600 and 1,800 local election officials respectively in those states. Um, and there's not a mechanism that tracks um, uh, election officials coming in and, and coming out. So I think there's there's work to do there potentially. And in addition to that, like in response to your earlier question about what can the feds do to help, I think a simple answer is that they can provide additional funding to our local election officials, many of which are under-resourced. Um, uh, largely in partnership with um, DHS's CISA, so the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, many election officials are getting physical security assessments of their offices. Um, the federal officials are recommending that many of these election officials improve the physical security at their office. So they're recommending that they get bulletproof glass. They're recommending that they get panic buttons. And the reality is that we have many election officials who simply can't afford to make those modifications to their physical office. But the federal government could provide funds for that. Yeah, and, and of course, it's the bigger problem of inadequate funding. And now um, a lot of states passing bills against private funding, which seems perfectly fine so long as there's adequate public funding. But if there's not adequate public funding, then, then you're really in a tough spot. Um, uh, sticking again with um, threats to election officials, but this, I guess this isn't in the area of threats, but this is at least in the area of harassment, uh, death by FOIA. Uh, I want to talk to you both about the kinds of really intrusive records requests that are coming in that are taking up the time and that are, you know, not really aimed at uncovering anything as much as just uh, giving busy work to election officials. Judd, I don't know if you can speak to that issue first. Oh, yeah, I can definitely speak to that issue. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, elections officials around the country at both the state and local level are being inundated with, um, uh, you know, let's be honest, they're, they're, they're not real uh, requests for information. They are requests to uh, design to uh, throw a monkey wrench in the gears. Um, uh, just to give you a framework, we had a, a lawyer on our staff whose uh, jobs uh, were many, and one of those was doing open records. And so uh, I would say that she, her her position was perhaps 20%, maybe a quarter dedicated to open records uh, prior to about 2016 or so. And then uh, subsequent to that, now we have one person who's who is a lawyer who is full-time dedicated to open records. And we have another person, her boss, um, actually his boss now, because we have quick, very recent turnover, um, who, who does a whole bunch of open records. And because there's such a public relations component to many of these, a lot of the communications team um, 
has uh, their time has been dedicated to open records. So uh, we've probably gone from what was a niche part of one person's duties to now occupying what is effectively two or three full people in our office almost on a continuous basis. And what, what, it, what it looks like in, in practice is a person will make a request and then two days later, they'll make a different request. And then two days later, they'll make a different request. And two days later, they'll make another request. It's, and it's, it's not real. They're not trying to find information because they want information. Um, they are just throwing information requests at us. Um, and there are ways that we can overcome it. It's just that, uh, frankly, it's complicated, it's hard because we want to provide good information to people who really want it and are making a legitimate request. So you don't wanna write a law that uh, hurts news media or hurts a, a member of the public who's really trying to do something legitimate. Uh, but at the same time, you want you wanna try to curb this behavior. And there's it's that's not an easy needle to thread. So it's, yes, uh, the FOIA and in our world, CORA uh, requests that we get are, are overwhelming at this point. And it's, by the way, much worse for the counties and much worse for the local. Um, and much worse because they're getting more or because um, they have fewer resources or both? Because they have fewer resources. They uh, typically, uh, so what they'll, what they'll do is a person will send out a request and they'll send it to all 64 counties. Well, uh, you know, 10, 15 of our counties can easily dispense of those requests pretty, uh, they have the staff, they have the infrastructure, they have the know-how, um, and then there are 50 counties that uh, don't have that kind of staff or uh, ability. And uh, we have, like I said, we have three counties that have under a thousand active registered voters. They have a county clerk who's basically, basically that's all they do is sit behind a counter and do DMV and elections. And uh, that's the entire staff. Well, that when that staff member gets the same request that Denver got, they are just not prepared to be able to answer that. Uh, but they're you know, good public servants, they want to do well. And so they call us up and they say, what do we do? And uh, we try to the extent we can to give them good advice and direct them in a way that meets the law. But um, you know, it's painful, it's hard. I do wanna remind everyone who's watching that if you have questions, you can put them in the Q and A chat. And we've already got some good questions there. Um, Liz, uh, let's turn to the, uh, unless you have something to add on the on the question of public records request, um, I wanna to turn to the insider threat. Did you wanna say something about the records? I would just say a, a, a description of the requesters that I heard at your conference, which I think is accurate, is that they are insatiable. Um, there is no amount of information that you, that election officials have been able to provide that is going to satisfy their, um, you know, uh, you know, demands for additional information in, in their, um, you know, in, in their efforts to really grind the local election official offices in particular to a halt. Yeah, so let's now turn, uh, before I get to the audience questions, back to the, the insider threat. Um, we heard from Judd, Liz, we heard from Judd about what Colorado is doing. Are we seeing similar stuff in other states or is this, a, you know, Colorado reacting to the most immediate uh, threat things? I mean, again, it's a patchwork. And I think that election officials and legislators across the country are trying to figure out how to address this problem, because as Judd explained, it's very, it's very tricky. Um, you know, the, the Brennan Center's come out with four basic recommendations, many of which um, the Colorado law picked up. So first, um, restrict access to the to the election systems, um, to the voting systems. Second, establish transparent procedures and monitor for inappropriate activity. Um, third, remove and prosecute officials who undermine um, election integrity. Um, and fourth, uh, you know, don't forget about the vendors. Um, you know, common sense procedures such as requiring vendors to undergo a background check and prohibiting their ability to remotely work on equipment at the elections office. Um, so, you know, states are trying, there's a lot of work to be done across the country and Colorado is definitely leading the way. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when we think about um, uh, in, an insider threat, um, yeah, you've got to bring in the, issue of public confidence. So even if all election officials are doing the right thing, 
um, people might not believe that they're doing the right thing. And so I wonder about how to balance concerns about transparency with concerns about, because you're worried about the insider threat, with concerns about um, uh, the privacy of election officials and getting in the way of election officials, you know, so that election officials can actually do their job. If you have a bunch of people literally crowding around an election official, very hard, you know, it's very hard to work, you know, under that kind of pressure. Um, so uh, let, me, let me ask each of you, I'll start with Liz and then go to Judd, you know, how do you strike this balance between transparency and I don't want to call it efficiency, but, you know, the, the ability to, to fairly administer an election and and tabulate those ballots. It, it's really tough. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of it is going to depend upon resources. So you see in a county like Maricopa County, um, one of the largest counties in the country and one of the, you know, well, a well-resourced county, right? So they have um, undertaken a variety of measures. They have 24-hour um, monitoring. That is, um, you know, everyone watching this uh, webinar can go online now and look into the, um, I believe it's the warehouse in their main office. I think they have about nine cameras that they live stream around the clock all year long um, to increase, again, this transparency. Um, they also put together, I believe it's monthly videos um, with the election directors to talk about how elections are run in Maricopa. Um, you know, there's huge, huge efforts underway, right? None of which are free in Maricopa County. Um, and election officials in other jurisdictions are attempting to, um, you know, again, communicate with voters on um, many times an individual basis. You know, we've talked to election officials who say that when they have a voter that has these concerns, right, they, they really try to work with them and provide individual tours of the elections office. Um, Again, they try to stay on top of the FOIAs because, again, they want to be transparent. It's just a matter of the, the resources that they have in order to be able to continue conducting free, fair, and secure elections and responding to this flood, many, uh, flood of FOIA requests that many election officials are facing. Uh, Judd? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of ideas. Um, I think personally that transparency is the, the key. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll so cite some examples that we've tried to do in Colorado. Um, first, um, we're very lucky in Colorado to have a strong county clerks association. Um, uh, Matt Crane is the executive director. I work very closely with Matt. Matt and I are partners in many of our endeavors. Matt is a lifelong Republican, uh, has been an elected official Republican. Uh, my office is uh, run by a Democratic Secretary of State. Uh, but yet we work in partnership um, almost daily on various issues. Um, and the fact that we can come at it as, as a unified force really helps us. And some of the ideas that Matt and I have been working on are things like uh, make all of the ballot images available to the public. So if you want to spend the next six months of your life going through and counting uh, who won an election, go for it. Here are all the images. You can collect them all from each one of the county websites. Um, right now, we're uh, statewide, I think we're up to about 10 or so counties that make available all the images after an election. Uh, I think that's a fantastic idea because, um, sure, I, there's nothing to see there. Uh, the equipment properly counted the, uh, the ballots and we audited those. And so there's really nothing to see. But if you have this great concern, or you and an organization of people want to get together and over several weekends, go through all these ballots and do your own count, go for it. I think that's fantastic. Um, I also believe, and Matt's a big in, enthusiast of this as well, that you can incorporate auditing throughout your entire elections process. So you, you audit the list maintenance that the counties do. You audit the, um, the, the work that the state does when it does its cancellation after the MVRA cancellation after uh, major election. Uh, we've worked closely with Vote Shield, which is an organization that um, provides daily updates to uh, uh, voter list transactions. Um, and, uh, and then I encourage uh, our counties to do 
uh, hand recounts after the, an election is complete. If, you, if you've gotten through an election and um, you've certified the outcome, if you wanna go back and as an office do an official count or run those ballots on a different system and see if the count comes back the same, uh, I think that's great. And then it shows to any people that doubt those outcomes in your counties or jurisdictions that you're taking every measure to make sure that the, the work is being done properly. Liz, uh, you know, in Texas, I think they've increased the ability of poll watchers to um, be uh, in the in the face of, of election workers. And I think they've actually criminalized um, election workers um, trying to um, make space, you know, against uh, against poll watchers. Is is that your sense of that that uh, some states are are making this, they're striking this balance differently in a way that could potentially um, interfere with how a, a vote counting is taking place or how elections are conducted? So I'm unaware of any other state outside of Texas that is has a similar bill or is considering similar bills. Um, however, you know, I think that election officials understand that um, temperatures are really high right now. Um, that said, they are not um, new to dealing with people that, um, you know, again, are very passionate about elections. And as I mentioned in Maine, um, the Secretary of State is now um, providing de-escalation training to election officials, which I think is absolutely um, a measure that many election officials across the country um, are are you know taking the opportunity to provide de-escalation training, and I think that CISA in particular has some great tools for election officials um, to help them with de-escalation in the event that it's necessary at polling locations. Hey Rick, I, I would uh, I can tell you a very quick story that you might find interesting. Uh, so uh, we had a recount um, over the summer this last summer when uh, a Secretary of State candidate, um, who is Tina Peters, by the way, the same person who is under indictment. Uh, when she asked for a recount, she was able to pay for it because she was she had lost by 18 percent, but she uh, wanted to um, see a statewide recount. So um, so we did a statewide recount and I spent a couple of days down in El Paso County, which is our most populous county. That's where Colorado Springs is. And um, Colorado Springs are the, the way that the El Paso office is designed is that they have this uh, essentially a fishbowl where uh, you can get in on all of three sides of it. And so the public can see through all the glass at what's happening as you're scanning ballots. And there's scanners lined up on the walls and people are uh, preparing ballots and so forth. Um, and so I was there for a couple of days and uh, uh, there were many members of the public that we saw who had their cameras set up on the glass and were tracking what was happening. There was one guy in particular that every time I entered the room or walked through, he would point at me as I would walk by. Um, so yeah, there are there are ways in which this becomes a little overbearing, uh, but to the degree that you can, and I I, I sympathize and, and uh, are uh, encouraging of the El Paso example, when you can provide that level of insight into what's happening, and if you want to camp out, and look through the glass for 72 straight hours, you can do that if you want to. Um, I think that that's generally a really good thing to do uh, because it does give people this feeling that at least they're trying to show us that it's fair and legitimate. I wanna to turn to uh, a question that uh, one of the uh, audience members asked, uh, it's to Judd. And the question is, to what extent was your office consulted in drafting the laws they appear to have been passed on partisan lines like many election laws. Do you see a path forward on getting bipartisan buy-in on these kind of laws? And after you answer that, Judd, I want to turn to Liz and ask, you know, uh, is there a partisan valence here like there is in so many other things or, or, or are we seeing parties come together? So I, that's a great question. And frankly, it's something I should have uh, mentioned in my presentation. Uh, I am proud to say that those were both bipartisan bills. Uh, they were not wildly bipartisan, but they were bipartisan. Uh, we had, uh, they were unanimously agreed to by the Democrats and we did have Republicans who uh, voted uh, in support of both of those bills. Um, and 
I don't want to overstate it, so this might sound like an overstatement, but we essentially wrote those bills. We worked with legislators to write those bills. Um, and the County Clerks Association, again, Matt Crane and the Colorado County Clerks Association, um, were hand in hand with us on every component of those bills. In fact, uh, in hard negotiations over this word instead of that word. Uh, so, um, and we were able to completely agree on them and, uh, and, and uh, were in total unison on uh, support for those bills. So we're pretty proud of that, that uh, Democrats and Republicans voted for it. The County Clerks Association was enthusiastic about it. Liz, I'm guessing the picture is not as rosy uh, in other parts of the country. I mean, I, I'm hesitant to say because I don't have the information in, in front of me, um, but certainly, um, you know, election security, um, you know, should be a bipartisan issue. And we've seen reasons to be hopeful in some states and on occasion um, in Congress. Uh, but I think, right, we're we're going to continue working the rest of this year. And again, it's, it seems very likely that we'll see additional election related bills in 2024, um, shortly before the presidential election, potentially. Well, you know, I'm thinking it's not quite the issue we're talking about today, but the the um, decision of a number of Republican states to leave Eric has got to cast a shadow here. And Liz, let me come to you first. Um, uh, how can you be uh, hopeful or optimistic when, I mean, Eric was the one of the few bipartisan success stories, voluntary, uh, and just for those who don't know, it's a, a resource that uh, states uh, can share voter registration information to keep voting rolls clean. So you don't have someone who's you know double registered and that stops fraud, but also makes systems more um, uh, uh, up to date and secure and seems like it's in everyone's interest. Um, it, is 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 the um, the withdrawal of some of these Republican states from Eric a, a warning sign on these issues as well? I think it's absolutely a concern, but I think we should remember that there are many notable Republicans that remain in Eric. Um, of course, Secretary Raffensperger has been very public about his support for Eric. And certainly, you know, in the work that I do, um, which doesn't involve Eric, but in particular about um, protecting our election officials, we, um, in addition to our um, uh, allies at R Street, um, protecting democracy and the elections group, uh, work to support the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections, which brings together very conservative um, and very progressive law enforcement and election officials to work on some common sense solutions to help protect election officials in the event that there is not um, a path forward for legislation, for instance. Um, you know, we work with a fantastic sheriff in Colorado, um, you know, Sheriff Justin Smith. Uh, he is a, a proud Republican, and he works together with um, uh, Sheriff uh, Peter Katujan, who's the proud progressive sheriff uh, from Middlesex, Massachusetts. And we've been able to find common ground, um, you know, which includes supporting endeavors to build the relationships between law enforcement and election officials, because law enforcement has a role to play, and that is a separate role from election officials. But they all believe, right, that protecting our elections and our election officials is, is important and a priority. And and working together to, to figure out how to move forward. Uh, John, I'm going to give you the last word about uh, either Eric or about the future in terms of what, you know, what you, you've been on that, you know, national, a bunch of national boards and associations. You're working with people in both parties. Uh, do you have some hope that uh, some of these issues can be solved on a bipartisan basis? Uh, I do. Um, and um, on Eric in particular, I I think that creating a, a, a Republican version of Eric will be difficult. It'll be very expensive. Um, and uh, I suspect that over time, we'll just, we'll figure out a way to get back together. Uh, maybe that's just me being optimistic, but I, but I do believe that it's possible. I also, I'll say that, yes, it's true that Florida, Missouri, West Virginia, Ohio, all left Eric um, in a bit of a huff uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, so it's sort of, it, they're kind of the villains in all of this. And I, I think that that's unfortunate because um, the other members of Eric could have done more 
to uh, to keep them. And so, while it's true that the Republican uh, those Republican led states uh, were quick to exit and shouldn't have, and frankly, it's totally countered their own uh, stated objectives. Um, they uh, the the other members of uh, Eric could have been more accommodating to try to keep them. And uh, I suspect that that's why uh, over time we'll probably be able to figure out how to get back together because all of us want the same thing. We all want good data to be able to do good list maintenance. We want to avoid uh, voter fraud. We want to you know try to get as many eligible people registered to vote as possible because registering people ahead of an election is better than registering at the election. So it's there's all sorts of reasons why we should all be on the same page. It's just a matter of trying to align ourselves a little bit better. And so, yeah, I'm probably seeing the word, world through rose-colored glasses, but, um, but I, I do believe that um, almost all of these objectives are held by uh, Republican states and Democratic states, Eric and beyond. And so um, once, if we find ourselves uh, beyond the sort of day-to-day -day vitriol that makes for our political conversation, I suspect we'll get to a point where we can, you know, reconnect on some of these uh, more um, obvious issues where we all are are very uh, closely aligned. Well, I feel like I need to rush to end on a on a happy note. Uh, so, unless Liz, unless there was something you wanted to uh, add, let me just say thank you to both of you for uh, a really informative discussion, uh, and uh, thanks to everyone who's watched our webinar series all year. Uh, we'll be back at the end of the summer with a, a, a new series of webinars. And in the meantime, you can find all of the materials from our uh, earlier uh, activities over the past year at safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. Uh, I'm Rick Hassan, you say law. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Be safe.